Welcome to the Bible's Greatest Mysteries from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are having the best time recording these programs. In fact, if you watched last week, you know that Derek has a brand new book out, and we've told you all about that, and I hope you've bought it. But this week we have an assignment, and you gave it away last week. I did. Well, let's make did. sure that you didn't <laughs> mistake it, because you never know with Tom Horn. Well, and there's here. also things that Tom wants us to discuss, too, items in the news. That, I uh, know. Yes. So there you go. Let's see what Tom has put in the bag for this week. Oh, well. Oh, my goodness. A yes. A lot of legendary things that we discussed, but turn ah. out that the archaeologists are finding they're not so legendary, Tom are they? Tom always puts up the best stories, and if you haven't watched his news feed, you need to go to skywatchtv.com. He's got all of those stories there. Well, um, Aaron Lipkin, of course, he's confirmed. Aaron Lipkin is our guest for the next few weeks, and it's going to be incredible. Oh, yeah. He's uh, like us. He's a big fan of archaeology, but he's got the advantage of living amongst the archaeology there. He can drive to the sites and actually walk amongst the stones. Oh, how so, nice. How yeah. nice. Well, speaking of archaeology, this story that Tom brought up, it's really interesting. King Solomon's riches? Yes. This is something that... Um, it's been kind of legendary for, for uh, many years. King Solomon's Mines. In fact, wasn't that a, uh, a very famous story? <laughs> very famous Alan story. Uh, yes, yeah. exactly. But it turns out that King Solomon's Mines actually exist or existed back in the uh, early Iron Age and that uh, archaeologists have found what they're calling the source of King Solomon's wealth. You know, strangely enough, I'm looking at here, it says it's in Timnah. Israel's Timna Valley, and yes. I believe that's on our itinerary for the 2022 tour of Israel. Yes, it is. It's down in the uh, the Negev, the desert south of Israel, and it apparently this was a very productive copper mining operation back in the day. In fact, the Edomites had been mining there previously, but Solomon really exploited it, and because copper was such an important metal back in that period of history, that uh, this helped make the kingdom of Israel around uh, in the 10th century BC, one of the wealthiest in the ancient Near East. Oh my goodness. That's a, you know, um, Timnah is one of those areas that I think most of us who love the Bible lands and read about them in the Bible, we, we don't even know it exists. Mm -hmm. It was a, um, you know, it, it's interesting because like many uh, many uh, technological advances in history, mm -hmm. it, they, they tend to be driven by... Need. Need, and uh, often that need is military, mm -hmm. uh, technological. Uh, if you come up with a new way of uh, uh, a new weapons system that's superior to those of your enemies, you wind up uh, suddenly able to defend yourself better or conquer. Need or greed. I mean, you well, and I just right. watched a documentary recently about a... Uh, a pharaoh in Egypt, a Djoser, very famous uh, stepped pyramid mm -hmm. that he had his um, mine workers, the quarrymen, they were working with copper tools. And because they ran through those tools so quickly, right. he needed millions of those those. Uh, right. um, so, so he needed copper. There's no copper in Egypt. In no, Egypt. There, there's not. But there is quite a bit in the uh, Sinai Peninsula and uh, into the Negev. And in Timna. And right. Pharaoh had sent his soldiers into these areas to, uh, to scout it out and, if necessary, take over the land. Yeah. Well, Djoser uh, was uh, in, in the third millennium B.C., mm -hmm. very early on. But the, the copper being a... Well, copper is still an important metal today because of its conductivity, but... Uh, Back in the day, uh, it was a, a technological breakthrough because the, the ages that archaeologists use to describe the periods of history, moving from the Stone Age to the current uh, technological age, went through the, the, uh, the Copper Age, then the Bronze Age, mm -hmm. when uh, uh, we learned to mix tin and arsenic with the copper in order to create bronze, which is a harder metal. Mm -hmm. I mean, copper was better for weaponry than, um, say, making stone. You know, flint, useful, but copper, better. But tin's Bron not available in the Levant, is it? I don't know. I know that there are places elsewhere in the Mediterranean where you can get tin. I know that the Cornwall in England was a very important source That's of tin. That's why Rome wanted that so badly. Yes, because 
Uh, well, it has other uses as well, but uh, when smelters discovered that by alloying these, these metals, you could come up with something much harder, bronze, and then when they realized that you could work with iron and developed iron around the time of Joshua and the, uh, the conquest of Canaan, that was the beginning of the Iron Age, uh, which is why the Old Testament, by the mm -hmm. way, mentions that during the period of the judges, the Israelites weren't allowed to have iron weapons by the Philistines. They had to go down there to get their <laughs> tools sharpened. But as they develop harder and harder metals for weaponry and for plows mm -hmm. and so forth, life became easier and better. But again, the military aspect of it, the military need, drove a lot of this. And Solomon, again, found a very rich, a very rich source of copper down in the Negev. This is very, really, this is not far from, uh, from Petra. No, it isn't. This is very, very interesting. You and I have talked about Petra many times. In fact, we've got a book planned for the future about Petra. But uh, King Solomon definitely had his men scouting all over the known world to get the riches that he needed, not just for the military, but also to decorate the buildings, including the Lord's Temple. And partnered with Hiram of, um, mm -hmm. of Phoenicia, Sidon, uh, Tyre rather, to uh, send, send uh, uh, trade expeditions around Africa and uh, around the Mediterranean to bring those riches back to, uh, to Israel. He did. And speaking of riches and the Lord's temple, one of the very first altars that was built for the Lord here, uh, not here, but in Israel, not here, we don't have it here, um, in Israel was Joshua's altar. And Aaron has been there. He took us there. Yes, that was fascinating because even... Israeli archaeologists, many of them who are very secular, tend to view the story of Moses, Joshua, and the conquest of Canaan as a myth that was invented to give Israel a national history, a sense of national identity. But around 1980, an archaeologist named Adam Zertal found that altar, and we were blessed to see it. And uh, We'll tell you about that altar, the discovery of the altar, and... Uh, and how you can go see it. <laughs> yes. When the Bible's Greatest Mysteries continues, we'll come back with Aaron Lipkin and the story of uh, Joshua's altar. Call now and take advantage of Skywatch TV's most groundbreaking deal of the year. With the rediscovery of the ancient prophecies from a mysterious group of prophets and scribes hundreds of years before Christ, your understanding of end times prophecy and the final age of man is about to be forever changed. In Josh Peck's new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, the veil is lifted as you discover how much of what you've been taught about Israel in the first century is incomplete. Shockingly, there were Jewish believers who knew exactly what to expect from the coming Messiah, that He would be God in the flesh, would die for our sins, and even the date of His first arrival. In Josh Peck's new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, you will discover lost prophecies only recently discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls about the time we are now living in, how the enigmatic group known as the Essenes formed and what influence they had on the New Testament, what hidden feasts and festivals the Essenes celebrated, and what messages the group left behind for believers living in the present age, how the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation fit within the Essene timetable, and how an ancient Jewish calendar actually predicts the prophetic significance of the year 2025. But that's not all. For the first time ever, you'll also receive Dr. Ken Johnson's massive three-book collection entitled The Ancient Mysteries of the Essenes, where Dr. Johnson compiles three of his most groundbreaking research studies on the Dead Sea Scrolls into one massive collection. In Book 1, The Ancient Dead Sea Scrolls Calendar and the Prophecies It Reveals, you will discover the secrets of the mysterious 364-day calendar used by the ancients since the time of creation and how it has been hidden until now for the appointed time. In Book 2, Ancient Testimonies of the Patriarchs, Autobiographies from the Dead Sea Scrolls, you will hear the previously hidden prophetic texts of such patriarchs as Enos, grandson of Adam, Lamech, father of Noah, Amram, father of Moses and Aaron, and even Enoch from the Book of Enoch fame. And in the most shocking revelation yet, Book 3, The Ancient Order of Melchizedek, you will learn astonishing facts about the enigmatic priest Melchizedek, such as why his priesthood was and is different from that of Levi, why the Messiah was ordained after the order of Melchizedek, and how the facts surrounding this mysterious order dramatically affect the theology and practical applications of our Christian walk today. This collection is an absolute 
absolute necessity for any researcher's library. And for those who want to fully step into the minds of the ancients and see the Dead Sea Scrolls like they never have before. Now you can get this incredible collection for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So don't miss out on Skywatch TV's most groundbreaking deal of the year, the Lost Prophecies and Ancient Mysteries Collection. Available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. The Bible's Greatest Mysteries is part of Skywatch TV, a viewer-supported ministry. This is The Bible's Greatest Mysteries. I'm Derek Gilbert, and joining us in studio is a gentleman who's facilitated our tours of Israel and showed us some archaeological sites that most visitors to Israel don't get to see. We're talking specifically this week about... Uh, Joshua's Altar. He is uh, not only a tour guide, he is a publisher and a video producer. He's responsible for the Hidden Israel series of DVDs, a, a book that uh, I found very intriguing, and this is one of the sites we visited. Sisera's Secret, the book by the archaeologist Adam Zertal. That's a reference to the Canaanite general who uh, was defeated by Barak and Deborah and got a tent peg in his head for his trouble. And uh, we saw his fortress. Uh, but uh, Joshua's Altar, also a fascinating site that most places, uh, most tours to Israel don't see. We welcome the CEO of Lipkin Tours, Aaron Lipkin. Aaron, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Derek. It's great um, to be here. Joshua's altar. Many of the claims about sensational discoveries related to the Bible um, aren't really backed by substantial evidence. But Professor Zertal, when he stumbled across this site... I, I think has found compelling evidence that this was, in fact, the site of the altar of Joshua. Yes, and I think it's important to remember that Zertal, unlike the Christian archaeologists that came to Israel in the early 20th century, he didn't come to look for the altar. Um, he actually was brought up believing that the Bible is a mythology, that the stories there never happened. Uh, when he uh, learned archaeology in the Tel Aviv University, the professors there told him, uh, they, they taught him, that all the stories are a fairy tale and they never happened. And so when Adam Zertal is coming and doing the emergency archaeological survey of Samaria, he's not looking specifically for biblical evidence, archaeological evidence for biblical events. He's just documenting. And I think that, that when you come from that perspective, uh, and you're coming from an objective perspective, and you're going into the biblical heartland of Israel, suddenly you start uh, finding things that really coincide with the uh, historical events in the Bible. And so when Adam Zertal is, is, is you know, roaming Mount Eval in Samaria and suddenly stumbles upon this pile of stone uh, and starts excavating it, um, he's, you know, he's, he's, taking, he's taking the outer layer of stones, suddenly this structure emerges. And, and all the time, he's not looking at the Bible. He's not looking at the historical Jewish writings about altars. He's just seeing a, a structure that he doesn't know how to explain. And what an archaeologist does, he goes to libraries. He checks in the Babylonian, the Assyrian, the Egyptian parallels to see if he can understand the structure, and he can't find anything. It takes a, another person to come to Adam Zertal and showing, show him the, the way the altar looked like at the second temple period for him to understand that it was there all along. The, the evidence for it being an Israelite altar is actually in the, the Jewish writings, in the Hebrew writings. And when you read the book of Leviticus, and it's, it's very clearly stated by God that when you build an altar made out of stone, it has to be made out of field stones. It has to have a way to go up to the Bama, to the higher court that is not with stairs, because stairs uh, might expose modest places in the body. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have a ramp. And suddenly he shows him uh, the picture of the second temple altar. Uh, and you have to understand, the second temple altar is 1,400 or 1,300 years after the ceremony that was conducted by Joshua. So what you're seeing is that tr the tradition of bil building an altar kept the same for 1,300 years at least until the time of Jesus in the Second Temple period. And that's astonishing. 
It, so he approached this from a secular perspective, and to his eye, what he saw was an Iron Age cult site, a religious site that he couldn't identify until somebody said, look at this, and he realized, wait a minute, the stories in, in our scriptures are true. Right, and, and so when, when he saw it, suddenly his whole world changed. I mean, his whole view of the Bible, of, of, of history, of biblical history changed. He, he looked at that uh, Orthodox Jew that gave him that, that book, and he said, you know, you understand what this means? This means that, that this is the altar of Joshua, and if this is the altar of Joshua, then Joshua existed, and Moses existed, and the Exodus happened. And, you know, this Orthodox Jew is looking at him and saying, of course, what do you mean? I mean, of course they <laughs> happened. But for Adam Zertal, they really did not happen. They were made up stories from, you know, the year 800 or 700 during the reign of Josiah. Um, but for, for suddenly he sees that the, the biblical tradition is very accurate. And, and the stories that were, that were written in the Bible are true historical events. Hmm. And so for him, that was really uh, something that changed his, his view. And, and you could see that in, in, in his different discoveries, he started reading the Bible to better understand the discoveries that he found in the field. And, and, and so the Bible, uh, this, this dynamic of going to the field, discovering the biblical uh, remnants, the biblical walls, the biblical towns, and then going to the Bible, reading what the Bible is saying, to better understand what they found archaeologically. Now, this discovery was about 40 years ago, and uh, we were blessed to visit the site back in uh, 2019. Um, it is definitely not a tourist destination, um, and yet you managed to get us there with an escort from the IDF, which was very much appreciated. Um, we never felt unsafe, but it was clearly something that uh, has not been turned into a destination for tourists. This past year, we saw the local Palestinian Authority uh, administrators begin to dismantle some of the outer uh, ring of stone, the, a fence, if you will, for the substrate to build a road. Uh, how was that changed the perception of the site in the minds of Israelis? Well, you know, I'm telling you, when uh, that morning when I started receiving text messages from friends, you know, did you hear the Palestinians destroy Joshua's altar? That was my nightmare. I mean, you know, thinking that maybe a, a, a bulldozer can come and just bulldoze the whole site for me was, was horrifying. But later on I understood that the damage was done to the perimeter wall around Joshua's altar. Now, for someone standing there, it just looks like a terrace, but that's actually a reconstruction of the ancient wall that was the wall of the compound that made it clear where, where is the holy area and the unholy area. And uh, Adam Zertal said that that is one of the footprint structures that the Israelite built in Israel. We're going to talk about that in another program. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I, you know, we went there immediately that day. I brought some Christian volunteers with me and there were some young Jews from communities in the area. And what we started doing was, you know, lifting stones and starting to rebuild the wall together. You know, and, and I stopped for a second and I saw Jews and Christians together, uh, you know, saving our Judeo-Christian heritage, our biblical heritage. And that was so moving. Um, and, you know, but, but you know, Balaam, and when we're in, about Balaam in the Bible, that he came to curse the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And eventually he blessed them. And what the Palestinians did unintentionally was to bring this site that was, is really unknown for many Israelis uh, to the news. And we started seeing thousands of Israelis coming to visit the site. You know, I've never seen this line of cars parking, you know, all the way up to the, you know, the parking lot where mm -hmm. we were with the bus. Uh, we saw young people coming and worshiping there and praying there. And believe it or not, even Naftali Bennett, our prime minister, Israel's prime minister, came to the altar, stood on the altar, and did an amazing presentation about how the Jewish people is not going to let the Palestinians, the Muslims, ruin our national heritage sites. This is very close to Nablus. I think people need to understand that it's very close to an area that has been um, a, a hotbed of, of 
conflict for many, many years. It's the site of ancient Shechem. Uh, the tomb of Joseph is there, and uh, uh, Jews who visit the tomb are often subject to uh, violence. Um, what is the state of Israel? Is, is Prime Minister Bennett uh, made any uh, definite plans for the future of Joshua's altar? Well, you know, unfortunately, politicians are very good at uh, <laughs> promising and In talking. Israel, too, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it, it, there hasn't been any, anything going on there since. Um, it, it, the only thing that really happened was that the altar came up to the consciousness of Israelis and, and the Israeli government, the Israeli army. The Palestinians are much more careful now with what they're doing close to that site. Uh, but when you're looking at the archaeological sites in Israel, you see that there is a lot of da damage that's being made by the Muslim population in Judea and Samaria. Uh, it's not in intentionally with an agenda to erase the, the, you know, the biblical sites and the connection between the Jewish people and the land. It's mostly robbers that come into those archaeological right, sites, right, right. just excavate to find coins and you know, different expensive artifacts. But uh, the problem is that the, the fact that Israel is not ruling Judea and Samaria like it should be creates a vacuum where people just come in and do what they want. And so, unfortunately, many sites are being damaged. And uh, we, what we're doing, uh, you know, our, us, us group of people who, are, who care about biblical archaeology is to um, try and pressure the politicians to, to take a stand and protect these sites. Uh, but it's uh, definitely not... Um, high on their priority list. Mm. What kind of efforts are being made to go back to these sites and re-examine some of the material that may have been excavated, looking for additional clues or evidence as to the origin of the site? Well, unfortunately, the site itself, Joshua's Altar, is in Area B, which is under the, respon the archaeological responsibility of the Palestinian Authority. So we cannot really excavate there until Israel regains its full control over the site, and I believe that it will happen one day. Uh, there is still a lot to excavate there. And, you know, our listeners and watchers really need to understand the importance of this site. The site is, uh, the, 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 I would say, the first temple of the Israelites in the land of Israel. Uh, you know, what, one of the discoveries of Zertalis is, is that the, the site itself was used for 70 years. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about the site being a, a central place of worship for many years. It's just a place for one ceremony, one day, blessings and curses mm -hmm. in Joshua 8. But the archaeological evidence shows that after that ceremony, the Israelites treated that site as the central place of worship before they moved to Shiloh. So you, you, everybody really needs to understand how important that site is biblically. Um, and so there's so much to excavate there, and uh, because we cannot excavate, the only thing we could do is actually just, you know, to take the archaeological dump from the 1980s, move it to a secure location, and wet sift it. Because mm -hmm. eventually, in ar archaeologically, there's really no importance for an archaeological dump. Uh, but Adam Zertal in the 1980s didn't wet sift it. Uh -huh. And so we wet sifted the, the dumps. And uh, we found some amazing stuff. We can't talk about it at the ah. moment. But uh, <laughs> hopefully very, very soon, uh, there's going to be a, a big declaration about something we did find in the dump. And uh, that's what I can say right now. I know Dr. Scott Stripling has used that method to great success at the site of uh, Shiloh, Shiloh Correct. Uh, and found some uh, very amazing things there too. So yeah, we look forward to seeing what comes from this. It was uh, one of the highlights of the tour, and I say one of the highlights of our ministry being able to visit that site with a group uh, from all over the world, uh, a lot of Americans, but all over the world, and to repeat the declaration of Joshua there, choose you this day who you will serve, the God of your fathers or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Exactly. Uh, that uh, made the hair stand up on the backs of our necks. It was uh, an amazing sight, and we're glad the site is still there, and, uh, and there is some effort, or at least a raising, uh, a growing awareness of the site, and uh, hopefully that translates into an effort to preserve it. Yes, and people from the group, I remember, said, you know, do you imagine, do you understand it happened here, it happened right here, and so this is definitely an exciting place to visit for every Bible believer, and, uh, you know, I, I really urge people to, to read Adam Zertal's book, yes. uh, A Nation Born, which talks about the discovery of Joshua's altar, 
and they can find it in, on our website at hiddenisrael.net. And if you want to have more information about the altar, they can visit the altarofjoshua.com, which also includes a lot of information about the site. And we invite every, everyone to come to our uh, tour in 2022. Fascinating stuff. And we've got a copy of the book here. Where did I put the book? Oh, oh yes, yes, we do. And uh, you know what? We don't carry that book at the Skywatch TV store, but you can go online and purchase it. Yes. Uh, well, Adam Zertal has written a couple of books, but uh, we'll talk about this next week. This is sort of a tease ahead to next week's program, The Footsteps Ooh, of God. reading ahead. Because one of, uh, one of the, the, the footsteps, one of the footprints, is uh, the, the fence around the area there um, at Joshua's altar. At Joshua's altar on Mount Eval. which we didn't actually comprehend as we were standing there. No, no. And uh, we'll talk next week about uh, how that recently was compromised, and it became mm -hmm. a political issue between uh, Israel and the Palestinian it Authority. It did indeed. Well, we right. want to hear from you, by the way. If you're enjoying the Bible's greatest mysteries and you want to maybe ask us a question or suggest a topic or a guest, send your email to BGM, that's for Bible's greatest mysteries, BGM at skywatchtv.com. We've got plenty of things lined up, uh, topics to discuss from uh, ancient archaeology to megalithic structures. That you can see if you go with us to Israel in 2022. <laughs> ha ha. Yes. Just go to skywatchinisrael.com and you'll see the entire itinerary there. You are going to want to go. Absolutely. Our Lord and Savior spoke the universe into creation. The world is a fascinating and mysterious oh, yes. place, but there is nothing in this world or in this in, in all of creation, that we should be afraid to investigate and, and question because the Bible has answers. Yes. That is our mission on this program. Our faith is not a blind faith. Our Lord left evidence for us, the eyewitness testimony, but also the testimony of the rocks. As Jesus said, Amen. the rocks would cry out. You can quiet my followers, but if you do, even the rocks will cry out. Well, that's what we're discovering. And this is a wonderful and amazing journey, and we're glad that you're joining us for it. Thank you for watching. This is the Bible's Greatest Mysteries from Skywatch TV. Yeah.